with you this evening. I think we got everybody. If not, almost everybody. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, that's where we'll start off this evening. As we finish up our series really on, uh, over the last several weeks, on spiritual, or I'm sorry, on, uh, we're going to go to spiritual gifts next week, but on the fruit of the Spirit. And so we come to the last characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit tonight. We've already looked at love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And so tonight we've come to the very, this is the first time I've done this and looked at each one individually. We come to self-control. And uh, that is, uh, it's interesting to stop and to think about tonight because we live in a culture of self-indulgence. Uh, we live in a culture where the, the, the attitude of self-control is not one that uh, would be high on the list of virtues in the world that we live in, the culture that we live in today. Uh, the motto uh, of the day seems to be, if it feels good, do it, right? Uh, we, you know, we live in the supersized culture where you know, we, it, it, whatever you want, you get, and you get a lot of it. Uh, we live in a day and an age when if you want something, you get it. Uh, you don't have to wait for it. You don't have to save for it. If you don't have enough money to get it, then you can always get a loan or you can use a card and you can pay for it later. Uh, and, and this is kind of the mindset of the culture that we live in. Uh, so this idea of self-control is very much needed uh, in the culture that we live in, and yet it is not one that is held highly. In fact, many people would say, why would you, why would you restrain yourself? Why would you hold back? You know, what, whatever it is that your heart desires is what you should chase after, is what you should go after. Uh, King Solomon would have fit uh, in very well in our culture. Uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 10, he wrote this, Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Right? There was a period in Solomon's life where he just said, whatever I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get. And he had the resources to do that. In fact, in and, and, and the last the last phrase there, this was my reward. This is the attitude of the day, right? This is what I deserve. Right? This, is, this is what is coming to me. You know, and, and so uh, very much the mindset of our culture today, the problem is this. The problem, it, it, and I don't know if, if it was later on in life, but in Proverbs chapter 25, many of which King Solomon penned, Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28, it reads this, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Now, over our time of study in the Old Testament, we have seen the significance of city walls. Right? Remember a few weeks ago, we looked at Judges, and Samson just ripped the gate of the city wall off, leaving that city exposed. And so what, what, what we read in Proverbs is this, a man without self-control, the inability to control himself, is exposed, is in danger. Right? And, and so... Very significant warning from the Word of God to us tonight that this issue of self-control is important. It matters. Um, the Word, you know, I, it, it, we're looking at Galatians 5.23 as far as where we come across the word temperance or self-control. Uh, and, and it simply means this. It literally means holding oneself in. Uh, if, if you can picture that in your mind. Yeah, it's a very, exp holding yourself in, it has the idea of restraining passions and desires that come from our flesh. It's an inward rule where we regulate every area of our life uh, under the authority and the control of God's spirit and God's word. Um, in Galatians 5, it stands in opposition to the deeds of the flesh, right? So we have the fruit of the spirit, but they stand in opposition to the deeds of the flesh and and remember, the, the flesh and the spirit are warring against one another. And we experience this very, very clearly when we talk about self-control. I, I think if, um, if, 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 if we were honest tonight, then each one of us would say this is a struggle for us. Now, when we start talking about self-control, that struggle is probably different for many of us, right? Some of us may struggle in this area. Some of us may struggle in this area. But when it comes to self-control, 
probably all of us have an area or an issue where we have a difficult time. You know, Hebrews 12 says that there's a sin which so easily besets us, right? There's a, there's a struggle, there's a battle. I had you turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, and, and we'll see the importance of self-control here. Uh, beginning in verse 3, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now that's good news, right? God has given us all that we need through his power. Who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. Right? There's our word. And self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Now notice what it says in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so this is significant. If we're going to be effective, fruitful servants for the Lord, then we need to seek after self-control, right? We, we, we saw that back in verse 4. This is something that we are to chase after. Or verse 5, make every effort to supplement. Uh, he goes on in verse 9, For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Well, that's a significant promise. Right? And so within that list is this aspect of self-control, also a, a fruit of the Spirit. And, and so we understand this. This area of self-control is much easier to define than it is to develop, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, when, we, when we say the word self-control, it's not hard for us to understand what that means, right? To control yourself, to control your desires, overruling your lusts, and, and, and you know, overruling your emotions whenever they're out of check with God's Word and God's Spirit. Um, you know, the, the concept of self-control, you know, it, it implies that there's a battle, uh, that, that, that there's a divided Self, does it not? Uh, implies that our self produces desires that are meant to be controlled. So, uh, I think of the words of Christ, right? Where he said, take up your cross daily, deny yourself. Right? And so, you know, daily, our self is producing desires that need to be denied or controlled. And so, just, just a very clear reminder that we have desires that must be held in check, right? This is a, this is a natural outflowing of, of the reality of the flesh that still exists in us. And uh, I, I think when we start looking at this, again, the order is significant, right? When we look at the fruit of the Spirit, you know, they're not separate, they're all one, they're all produced through the Spirit of God, but... You know, as we come to the last one, self-control, I think if we get, if we start at the beginning and we get them in line, then self-control is going to be the natural outflow, right? So when we talk about love, joy, and peace, right? Those were God-word attributes. If we are loving God right, and then the, la the next three were others-related oriented, right? So if we are loving God rightly, and then we are relating to others rightly, then we're going to relate to ourself rightly, right? And so, the, again, the clear teaching of Scripture is always God first, others next, us last, right? And so when we have that mindset, and certainly when we think about the fruit of the Spirit, self-control is last because when we put those things in order, then that's going to be the natural outflowing of that. If I'm loving God and I'm loving others, then my, my desires are going to come in last place. Right. And so that's difficult for us, right? Because we are 
trained and ingrained that we need to look out for our needs, that we need to, you know, we need to put ourselves first, that we can have it our way. And yet the Bible says we need to deny ourselves. All right, and so, you know, when it comes to this area of self-control, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, and he compared the Christian life to uh, Olympic athletes. So if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, we'll, we'll look at this comparison from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 24 and 25. He writes this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Now, he's thinking about the Olympic race here, the marathon race. Everybody runs, but only one wins, right? So he says, run in such a way that you will win. <laughs> now, when it comes to the Olympic Games... If you're going to win, then you have to prepare yourself, right? If you enter, I, I'll just say this, right? When I mean, we have a half marathon here in town, if you decide the day before the half marathon that you're going to go out and run that, you're going to have a hard time, right? It's going to be very difficult for you. You are not going to win. In fact, if you decide to prepare and train, you're still not going to win because those Kenyans are going to come and they're going to win every year. But... <laughs> If you're going to run a race like that, you've got to prepare yourself, right? The, these Olympians devote their lives to preparing for, a, I mean, even today, when you, when you think about the Olympic Games, these Olympic athletes have devoted their entire life to a moment that often is over in, in sometimes seconds, right? But they've, they've, disciplined their body, they've disciplined their diet, they've disciplined their relationships, they put many things aside, all pointing to this one moment. Why? So that they may win. And Paul compares the Christian life to this kind of attitude. He, he, he goes on in verse 25 to say this, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we and imperishable, right? And, and here's the motivation, right? I mean, it, it's sad in a way because these athletes will give their entire life up to that moment to reaching that goal. And it's a temporal, it's a temporal victory. In fact, can you remember Olympic winners? Most of them? Hardly any, right? In, in the longer that time goes by, the more likely we are to forget. Yeah. Those victories that are so celebrated will, will pass away with time. But we chase, we run as those who will win. Not a temporal victory, but an imperishable crown. Right. That, that's the picture here. And, but, but the comparison is the same. If we're going to win, then we are going to have to deny ourselves. There's going to be things that we need to set aside. There's going to be areas where we have to discipline ourselves. Uh, this, this, um, you know, these athletic references abound in the scriptures. Uh, you think of Hebrews chapter 12. I mentioned earlier, there's a sin that so easily besets you. Uh, you know, he, he says, lay, lay aside every weight and that sin that you may run the race that is set before you. Um, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, you know, Paul said, endure hardness as a good soldier and then as an athlete, and then as a farmer, just, again, pointing to that area of discipline and, and, and hard work and self-control, relating that to the Christian life. The Christian life was never meant to be, you know, on, on cruise, right? I mean, that's kind of our mindset sometimes when it comes to, I'm going to sit in my cozy, cushy pew, and I'm going to enjoy, and I'm going to receive but that's not what the Christian life is about. The Christian life is meant to be, it's meant to be work. Where we're pouring ourselves out, exerting ourselves. What? For the honor and glory of the Lord. There's the, there's the goal, right? There's the, there's the reason that we exist. Um, 1 Timothy 4, verse 7. Train yourself for godliness. Exercise yourself unto godliness. 
um, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good image for us, isn't it? Because if, if any of you are, are regular, active in exercise, you know, you know you have to be consistent, right? If, if you're inconsistent in your exercise, your physical, act, then you're going to gain very little ground. In fact, more often than not, you lose ground, right? I mentioned the half marathon when, you know, we, we kind of plan and prepare to do that every year, and we do a tough mutter in the fall. And so we're entering that time where I'm going to start to prepare. And typically, through the winter, I'll be doing some type of activity just to keep myself ready to do those things. This year, when we finish the tough butter in the fall, essentially I've done nothing <laughs> until now uh, when it comes to, and you know what happens? You lose ground very quickly. The strength, the endurance, all of those things, you, know, you, you can't build up and then just stop. And so when he says train yourself unto godliness, it's not like, it's not like in your spiritual life that you can just kind of sprint out, like, I'm going to do really good today, and I'm going to read the Bible today, and I'm going to pray today, and those, those gains that you experience from that are going to last and last and last. We need that every single day, training ourselves consistently, or what happens over time is we become very spiritually weak, right? And so that's the picture that Paul's painting when we talk about self-control and Time's getting away from me very quickly, all right? Self-control primarily is an inward issue, right? We, we tend to think about outward areas, right? The, I, I, I got to control this and I got to control it, but it starts in the heart, right? When Jesus was talking about these deeds of the flesh, he wrote in Mark chapter 7, Mark 7, verse 21 to 23, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile a man. Right, so our greatest enemy when it comes to self-control is ourself, right? It's, it's our heart, right? Our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. These desires, they creep up from within. And if we ignore them, we don't deal with them, they don't go away, right? It, eventually, what happens is these desires, they will slowly, gradually creep up, and over time, they'll drown out. They'll drown out the Spirit of God. They'll drown out the Word of God. And so I think it's really important that we know ourselves. It's really important that you know the areas that you struggle in, that you know your weaknesses, that you identify those areas, uh, and, and that you're mindful of that always because you know, the, the picture in Genesis 4 is what? Sin is it's waiting at the door, right? That's always true, always true. Sin is always creeping, always waiting. And so the picture for us is, is know our self. Every single sin is really a breakdown in this area of self-control. We have decided, we've made a choice that I'm going to choose my sinful desires over the Spirit, right? That's, that's what it is. Um, you know, when you look at the Scriptures, time and time again, we have seen great men, uh, men of the faith. In fact, the men I'm going to mention tonight are all listed in the Hall of Faith, but each one of them had a moment in their life where they gave in to their sinful, fleshly desires, and it cost them greatly. You remember Moses? Moses entering into the promised land, but he got so frustrated and fed up with these complainers around him that he struck the rock. And God said, Moses, you're not entering the promised land. I mean, this is a man who put up with so much. <laughs> he was faithful. And then in that one instant, in that one moment, uh, one lack of self-control, and it cost him. I mean, you think of David. Mighty king, he slayed his ten thousands, but he stayed away from the war, and he stayed at home. And he saw a woman from his balcony, and he pursued her, and it led to adultery, and it led to murder, and it led to disaster in his family, right? Just a, a moment, a lapse of self-control, and boy, what a picture that we saw with Samson. <laughs> Samson did what was right in his own eyes, right? Constantly chasing and pursuing. Each one of them listened to the Hall of Faith, not that 
Not that these things disqualify us, but it's a reminder. I, I, I've always, in talking to teenagers, just you, know, you could end up someplace you never thought you would be in a moment. The same thing's true for us, right? In, in an instant, in a moment, your life can change drastically with a poor choice, often a choice that is a result of a lack of self-control. So I think we understand the significance of this. How do we develop, how do we develop self-control in our life? Because I think this is a struggle. It's definitely a struggle for me if, as my wife and I share with one another about different things that we, we battle with. This is an area that constantly comes up, right? And so I, I'm sure you can relate to that. How do, how do we deal with that? How do we, get, how do we strengthen ourselves in this area? And it's interesting that we say we strengthen ourselves because that's our mindset, right? When it comes to self-control, no matter what the area is, we, t- we, we tend to go, what? I'm going to do better, right? This time, I'm going to get it. And we tend to look at ourselves, and when you look at the word, that would logically be the path you would take. But paradoxically, when it comes to self-control, if we're going to experience any gains, then it's going to come through spirit control. Right? That's the, the fruit of the spirit is self-control. So this is flowing out of the power of the Holy Spirit, and then we see ourselves being able to make the right choices and make the right decisions. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit is all supernatural, right? This is not a work of the flesh in any way. And so if there's an area that you're struggling and battling in, the key is going to be what? (laughs) Understanding that you can't do it, and, and daily, daily, running to the Spirit of God for help, right? I can't do this. Uh, Now, that doesn't negate, it doesn't negate the responsibility that we have, the effort that we have in in, in seeking to overcome it, right? Sometimes, sometimes we start saying, well, I can't do it. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Then we have this let go and let God mindset. That's not scriptural either. We don't do nothing it, it, let me share with you, I don't have time to turn, Colossians 1.29. Colossians 1.29, Apostle Paul is writing, he says, For this purpose also I labor. <laughs> right. So Paul says, I labor, striving according to his power. Now, how do you balance that? I labor, but it's his power. That's, that's what we're talking about. When we talk about the fruit of the Spirit in our life, we labor, we work, we exert ourselves. He says, which mightily works within me. Both are true. At the same time, we pour ourselves out for this cause and this purpose, but it is his power in me, right? Philippians 2.12, I am working out my salvation, but God is working in, right? And, and so there's the key to this. When we, we run to the Spirit of God because that's where we find self-control. Now, there's lots of areas that we could talk about. I wanted to. Li- I, I, I listed seven. I don't know how far we'll get through these. Um, we need self-control in every aspect, every area of our life. Number one, we need self-control uh, of our bodies, right? First Corinthians six nineteen. You know, your your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are His. Our bodies are. His. And so when we think through that, that, that means that we need to take care of our bodies, right? That means that we should get proper rest. Uh, we should avoid extremes, uh, extremes of laziness on one end and extremes of you know, workahol- workaholism on the other, right? We, we must take care of our body. Um, it, it means, yes, getting proper exercise, eating Eating healthy, right? Moderate proportions. This is one of those that hits home for me. I like to eat, and I like to eat a lot, right? And, and so when I think about self-control, this is an area that I need, to, I need to do better in, right? But it comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. This has, has it relates to our sexual desires, right? That all of these are God-given desires, but they're desires that must be They must be met within the confines of the Word of God. And all sexual desire is meant to be played out within the context of the marriage relationship, right? So, yes, control our body, but also controlling our minds, 
Uh, we live in, in a day where we are bombarded, our minds are bombarded constantly with messages from the media, ungodly ways to think. And so we must control our thought life. Um, Philippians 4.8, right? Think on these things. Are you familiar with you know, the, the 4.8 filter? You know, whatever things are good, whatever things are true, whatever things are lovely, whatever of good report. If there's anything praiseworthy, right? Think on these things. Um, Colossians 3, 2, Paul said, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So there, there's a significant there's a, you know, emphasis in the scripture about what we think and how we think. It, and we've got to be very careful because there's a, a constant message being fed us. So we've got to be careful what we watch. We've got to be careful what we listen to, you know, the way in which we take things in, uh, the old the old phrase that I always used was, was gigo, right? Garbage in, garbage out, right? And so if we're taking in garbage, if it's coming in through the eye gate and through the ear gate, that's what's going to come out of our heart. And so the way we control our thought life is what? We need to take in things that are good. We need to input the word of God, memorizing, hiding God's word in our heart. How shall, how shall a man cleanse his way? Psalm 119, 10, right? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. I have hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Right? That's the picture here. Controlling our mind. Um, controlling our emotions. That can be difficult, right? A lot of times when it comes to emotions, the typical response is this. That's just who I am, right? I'm, I'm a hothead. Or, you know, I'm, I, I tend to, I, I'm kind of prone to depression. I'm prone to anxiety. Um, you know, and so those things may be true, even genetically, you know, as a family. This may just be something you see, a pattern in your family. But we cannot use the excuse that this is just who I am. Why? Because this promise of, the, of self-control is one to every single believer. You know, no one's excluded. As we're filled with the Spirit of God, we can control. It may be more difficult for you if you are somebody who typically flies off the handle it may be more difficult for you than for somebody else who just has a, a more calm demeanor. But the reality is this. We cannot, we cannot just let our emotions control us. We must control our emotions if we're going to grow in godliness. Number four, control your time. Again, this is a big one. This is, you know, we live in a, a fast-moving culture and so we're constantly hearing people say i'm so busy i don't have time i just don't have time i don't have time and and, and sometimes we need to evaluate the way we use our time right because there are there are things that we can allow into our life that control us instead of us controlling them um yeah i fear we probably live we probably live in the day and time where we waste more time than any other culture in history uh, I believe that to be true as I look, you know, I mean, we, we're, we, we have TV and movies and, and games and social media, and some of these things dominate our life. I mean, we, we took a, a word that was used for, um, for eating, binge, right, binge eating, binge drinking, we've applied it to the way we watch, and, and we watch TV or watch movies, binge, binge viewing, right, where we just sit down for hours and hours in front of a television, and, and take in, take in, take in. Now, I struggle in these areas, all right? I, I, this is part of the culture that we live in. So we must evaluate the way we use our time because it's going to hinder. It's going to hinder our walk. It's going to hinder our relationship if we allow things to control us rather than allowing, you know, rather than controlling our time. Uh, finances, we mentioned at the beginning, you know, that kind of mindset, if I want it, I'm going to get it. Uh, you know, oftentimes, we see people struggling financially, and many times, that struggle was because of poor choices when it came to, I really should not have made that purchase, right? I didn't have the money to make that purchase. And so we see mounds and mounds of credit card debt that have piled up even among Christians, among the people of God who are struggling because they, have, they are living beyond their means. And so this is an area we have to, we have to be good stewards in, you know, using the resources that God has given us wisely. Number six can be tough. Control your 
tongue. <laughs> it's tough because James says no man can tame the tongue. Right? This is an, it's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And, and, and again, it's that mindset. No, we can't, right? We can't control our tongue in and of ourselves. However, under the control of the Holy Spirit, and that applies to a lot of different areas, right? It applies to um, you know, language where we tear others down. It, it applies to cursing, to foul language, to lying, uh, to talking inappropriately, inappropriate jokes, gossip and slander. All of these fall under the category of controlling our tongue. Um, you know, Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt talk proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. You know, the old, the old saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. That's a good, that's a good mindset, right? So only that which is good to the use of edifying. All right. And one more, controlling your relationships. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is this. Bad company corrupts good morals, says 1 Corinthians 15, 33. If, if you have relationships that are, that are negative, that are, that are pulling you away from the Lord, you need to control those. In fact, sometimes you need to put a stop to those, particularly if you're in an um, you know, unequally yoked kind of relationship, whether that be you know, a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, you know, or whether it be a, like a business relationship. You know, scripture is very clear. We need to avoid those. But there are times where just because this is who I work, I work with a lot of unbelievers. I'm around unbelievers all the time that we can begin to develop close relationships with unbelievers. And those close relationships are pulling us farther apart than they are drawing us closer to the Lord. Right? So we've got to be really careful about intimate, close relationships. Now the key is back in, verse, in Galatians 5. In verse 16, he says, walk, you know, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, right? Be filled with the Spirit and you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Right? That's pretty straightforward. Um, so primarily, the key to, to, to living a self-controlled life is going to be dependence on the Spirit of God. But there's some common sense. There's some common sense that, that plays into this area of self-control. Uh, I'm going to move quick. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 10 says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. <laughs> now that's pretty, pretty simple, right? If you're tempted, don't do it. <laughs> well, I, that sounds easy, right? But, but the concept is, just, is very no nonsense, common sense. There's going to be times where we have an easy way of escape. We just have to take it. Um, we, you know, what are some practical steps that we can put in place when it comes to self-control? Um, yeah, I mean, we'll use the, we'll use the eating example, all right? We, we like to eat more than we should. So what are some practical steps that we could put in place? Nancy. Have a plan, right? That's a really good start, right? If you have a meal plan and you're planning out what you're going to eat, you're less likely to make a poor choice if you plan ahead than if you make a decision on the fly, right? right. Set closer to the table. Set closer to the table. <laughs> so when your belly gets full, you feel it, all right? That's norm advice right there. All right, let's, uh, let, let's, let's pick it. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to it. Okay, um, the, the games and social media, right? Whether it be internet kind of thing, you know, Facebook. Tw the, you know, if, if you're, if you're trug struggling in that area where it's dominating your time, what's some practical advice? Stop it. <laughs> Don't do it, right? I mean, that's the... That... I mean, and I'm, I'm kind of guilty of this too, right? I'm out, and I get a moment where I stop. And this is really true in the smartphone kind of culture. I just pull my phone out, start checking Facebook, right? What's going on with everybody? What's going on with everybody? Is, and it, you sit down at your computer to work. Well, I'm going to check Facebook first, or I'm going to check this first, or I'm going to do that. You know, some of you ladies like Pinterest. But, you know, that is hours and hours of no fun for me, but... This is something that you guys could spend a long time on, right? So what do we do? 
It's easy to say, just don't go there, but is that realistic? Now, it may be, if, this is a, if it's a serious issue where it's completely, then you may need to just say, you know what? Facebook is not for me. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, this is something I can't handle because it's controlling me. Yeah, that, that would be advice, you know, if, if somebody's struggling with pornography, you know, and, and you, you know, it's available on my phone, it's available on my internet, it's available on my computer, what do you do? Well, get rid of the internet. If, if, you know, that's a drastic measure, but Jesus said, pluck your eye out, right? <laughs> it, it, it's better to, better to go into having maimed than, than having two hands or two feet or two eyes, right? And so sometimes when it comes to this area, we've got to take very drastic measures. Now, I don't have time to walk through each one of these tonight. So think through, right? Know yourself. Know the area that you struggle with. Having a plan, whether that be eating or, or any other area, having a plan is really important. When it comes to using of your t- use, you know, the use of your time, if you plan out your day, that, that makes a significant difference, right? So those are practical steps. Apostle Paul said, make no provision for the flesh. If there's areas that you know you struggle in, you know, I mean, <laughs> if, you know, if, if you know you shouldn't be eating cookies, don't go sit in front of the cookie jar, right? That's... That's, that's the mindset that we have here. Uh, there's no magic, you know, formula when it comes to self-control. Sometimes it's very simple, no-nonsense, common-sense steps that we should take. So primarily, relying on the Spirit of God, but practically taking common-sense steps to deal with these areas in our life. Um, our time's up, right? Uh, Jesus said, number one, You'll know them by your fruit, right? So ask yourself, what's more prevalent? What's more evident in my life? Is it the fruit of the Spirit or is it the deeds of the flesh? If I see the deeds of the flesh at work in my life and it's just so prevalent, it's so overwhelming, and I don't see the the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in my life, then I probably need to evaluate myself. I probably need to ask myself, am I truly in the faith? Uh, But for us as the people of God, you know, I, I know we start talking about, you know, each one of these areas that it can be a little overwhelming because it's home in a lot of areas. So my encouragement to you tonight would not be to try and fix everything, but rather just to spend some time in prayer and say, Lord, you show me, show me the areas of my life where I'm struggling and then help me in that area, right? That, what, you know, start with one because if you try and fix everything at once, it's going to be a mess and you're going to fall. And the fact is when you try and fix one thing, you're going to fall and that's all right because when you fall, you get back up and you keep going, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. Because in our flesh, we're going to fail and fall every time. The Apostle Paul said what? The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I hate, that is what I do. And yet, looking at the end, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's our hope, right? There's our hope. The victory, the power over sin has been won in Christ. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together and your word and just how you speak to us. And I pray that you would help us to be spirit-filled believers, that we would see evidence of the fruit of the spirit in our life. Father, that as we leave this place, the world would see in us something supernatural, something different that they do not see anywhere else. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Lord, may these be characteristic of us as your people. And Lord, may they see us and look to you because it is only through you that we see these things come to pass. Father, you know each need tonight. You know each heart. I pray for, uh, especially for those physical needs that were mentioned. And uh, Lord, I pray for healing where it is needed. Oh God, we pray for those situations where it seems like uh, to man it is impossible. Lord, when you move in those ways where you defy the wisdom of this world, you alone get the glory. And so we pray for that. We thank you for the news of answered prayer tonight. Lord, we just ask it all in Jesus' name.